You're listening to the Leaving Inside Out podcast, and I'm your host, Tux Arutare. This is episode six. Thank you for tuning in to the Leaving Inside Out podcast, where we don't make emotional decisions. Oh no, (laughs) we go deeper. Episode six is joy or pain, emotional decision making. How have you been? I am still in a place of wonderment because wonder isn't enough of a word to describe what my kids have been up to. In the middle of the night, all four boys decided they wanted to make burritos and they did from scratch. And They made apple crumble from scratch as well. I don't know whether to be angry that they were cooking when they should have been sleeping and eating us out of the house, or to be happy that they have each other and like my friend Susie said, they are building memories, they understand teamwork and all that wonderful stuff. I just don't know. So I'm going to leave this here for now. Thank you for your feedback on the previous episodes. I'm still getting messages about the rock star story and I'm so happy that episode two is having such an effect on you. Although I didn't declare the principle of intention an official series, it is connected closely with today's topic which explores how our emotions drive our decision making. My hope is that if you struggle with indecisiveness as I do, by the end of today's podcast, you would have reworked your decision-making process and you'd start to feel more in control. So my sons had been asking for a pet for years. They wanted a dog or a cat, anything that wasn't human. My husband isn't fond of cats and that's putting it mildly, so that was out. We all love dogs, but I knew walking them and caring for them would end up becoming my responsibility. And thank you very much. I'm not here for that. Last year, I surprised them by bringing home two adorable bunny rabbits. The reason it took years to finally go for it, because most of my boys are in their teens now, was because I wanted to spare them the pain I experienced from the loss of a pet when they died. When the pets died, I mean. (laughs) And I'll see how that sounds. Growing up, we, we had dogs and cats and a few other interesting pets, but our dogs always died, you know, one after the other. We would have them for a while, they'll pass away, we'll cry. And we found out belatedly that the dogs were being bitten by snakes. Because I grew up in Benin and we're surrounded by a lot of land and a lot of sun. I remember the sadness, the sorrow we felt every time our dogs died. And this memory, plus my need as a mom to shield my kids from pain, kept the pets at bay. Here's what I came to understand the day I brought home the rabbits. Joy and pain use the same doorway to enter or exit our minds. So to shut the door to pain will mean reducing life experiences, including the joys that my kids would have experienced as children. This applies also to adults. If you spend your life avoiding painful situations, you will miss out on joyful ones as well. And in the end, You're still going to experience pain because that's what life is made up of, joy and pain. To live life to the fullest means to embrace all that life has to offer and to enjoy it. In the previous episode, I talked about how I had sabotaged myself by desiring one thing, which was the growth of my business, but my intention was way off. Well, that wasn't the only time or situation in which I showed up with a different, unrelated intention. It turned out that I had a habit of making decisions based on how much pain I could avoid or how much joy it brought me. Like intention, 
this was a process going on beneath my conscious level. So I wasn't immediately aware. When I look back on my life, I cringe at many of my wrong decisions. Now, I don't expect perfection and I don't expect to have a life that is free from mistakes. But I have made a good chunk of decisions out of the fear of pain. I've also made many decisions based on how much joy it would bring me. When we consider that the mind, which is where emotions are formed, is not the life-giving part of us. It starts to look a little bit careless to leave the reins of our lives in the hands of our emotions, which is so flippant because one minute we're happy and the next we're sad. So last night found me in a state. I was very irritated because I was interviewed by a major newspaper which featured my business and the feature came out in the paper just yesterday only to find out that the quotes that they had attributed to me were not what I said. My words were altered and while the overall gist remained, which was a business feature in a well-respected publication, the vibe that the article gave was not a true representation of me or my business and I was upset about it yesterday. But then today... (laughs) I feel differently having spoken to a few people who helped me to see another side, which I didn't see because the truth is, I was only looking for the imperfections. Today, I feel different, almost elated even. Same story, same circumstance, two opposite emotions by the same person. Because emotions are never reliable, they are not trustworthy enough to allow them to drive our decision making. So I started to observe, particularly in those moments where fear was involved. I think fear drives a lot of our decisions, which isn't always bad. If you fear for your life, you run, right? There's a best selling book my friend Ophelia gifted me, and you may have heard of it. It's called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, and I've left the details in the show notes. It isn't a morbid book, although it did stay on my bookcase for ages until she assured me it wasn't dark, because I don't like dark material. (laughs) But one story stood out for me, and to give you a background, the book was written by a palliative nurse who cared for end-of-life patients in a hospice. Over the years, she began to pull together the most common regrets her patients listed, and she compiled the top five and published the book. Now, while it's not a morbid book, it will send shivers down your spine as you begin to identify the likelihood of you having some of these regrets if you don't make changes today. And I'll share just one story, completely paraphrasing here. But Grace was married for 50 years, and she did all the things she cooked and looked after her home, raised her kids, she was a wife to her husband. Everything that was expected of her, she did. But she spent most of her life wishing she had a different life from the one she was living. Her husband was difficult and controlling and she dreamed of traveling the world. Finally, because that's the adjective you'd use when you're waiting for someone to exit your life, He got admitted permanently to a nursing home. She was so excited about the prospect of her newfound freedom with plans to travel and live the simple, peaceful life that she had craved for over 50 years. She was also now in her 80s, but she was strong and in generally good health. Just as she was making plans to start her life at her grand old age, she fell terminally ill. She became bedridden and all the plans that she had and the life she had finally had access to had to be permanently put aside. She could have divorced her husband, but she feared what people would say. In her time, divorce was heavily frowned upon and the thought of disappointing her family and adopting a bad name for herself 
kept her tethered to a bad marriage. Perhaps this is you. And it might not even be a marriage, but it could be a job or some other type of relationship. I believe culture and religion, incorrectly applied, have the power to hinder us. Like Grace who towed society's line only to end up living with, or should we say dying with, regrets, there's a collective voice which tells us how to live our lives. I used to be in a church that used fear to hold its members back. Once a member left, they'd vilify them. And this tactic is most likely used to prevent them from losing members, but it is also manipulative and certainly not of God. But it worked because people are afraid of their names being tarnished and they're afraid of being spoken of in in such negative terms. What environment is fear keeping you in? Fear is just one of the crippling emotions that keep us from excelling. When it comes to fear, I have a lot, a lot to say about it because I have wrestled with it for years. I have dissected it. I've turned it upside down. I have tried various methods for, you know, managing and dealing with and trying to get rid of fear in my life. And my experience of turning it left, right and upside down has shown me various angles with which we can view fear. But fear will stop you from leaving the life you want and you'll end up settling if you if you allow it to. What pain are you afraid of? What do you think will happen if you take that step? In the end, despite fear's apparent power to hold us back, it really is just an emotion. It is certainly not a reliable tool for deciding the direction that your life is going to take. So as I got a deeper understanding of how I had been making my decisions, I became very conscious and asked myself repeatedly, sometimes even multiple times a day, what joy is driving you this time, Tux? Or what pain are you trying to avoid? And this is a real practice that I still do. And sometimes I can only get the truth out by writing it down on paper because I don't know if it's just me or everybody else, but it's it's not very easy admitting to yourself a flaw that is so silly, (laughs) you know. So to admit that, hey, I'm refusing to send that email because... Um, I don't want the recipients to think of me in a funny way, even if that email is going to make me lots of money. That's silly, but I can write it down on paper. I had been friends with a particular girl for a while and we didn't really have much in common. She was passive aggressive. She had a sly way of putting me down. People like her tend to wrap their insults with a joke (laughs) and a smile. So I knew the friendship, in quotes, wasn't good for me, yet I remained in it. And do you want to know why? Because she was really good at flattery. So on the one hand, she'd put me down, and on the other hand, she'll compliment and sweet talk me. I stayed in the friendship because of the joy of being admired. I believe we attract our weaknesses. If you're seeking validation because you have the imposter syndrome, like I did, chances are you'd attract people into your life that will fill that void. And while on the surface, it might seem like a good idea to have someone make up for your weaknesses, the truth is some weaknesses are caused by a problem deep within you. And this is what needs to be addressed. Again, it's like dressing up a festering wound caused by flesh-eating bacteria, but then you leave the bacteria to keep growing in the wound. That's why I believe we must strive to live from the inside out. Last Christmas, we visited a region called Vistabella in Spain. I have always loved palm trees and remarked to my host about the magnificent trees that lined the streets. They used to be hundreds on each side, she said. They've been decimated. The council operated most of them. I was horrified. Who would do that? Well, what had happened was, 
the government bought a ton of palm trees from Egypt and the landscape was completely covered by them and it looked amazing. Months later, these trees started to fall down without warning. They seemed perfect. Their leaves and fruit were healthy, yet this kept happening. So they treated and sprayed the trees to combat the most common plant diseases, but nothing came out of it until someone had the good sense to open them up, only to find that the trees were hollow And no, the Egyptians did not sell them bad goods, but a species of weevil had been imported with the trees and they ate their way all around the inside. What was going on inside each tree was creating a problem that wasn't obvious to the naked eye, yet the problem resulted in the death of the tree. Spraying the outside did not solve the deadly internal problem. Just like having a flattering, toxic relationship will not solve your internal problem of self-doubt. For most of my life, I have always been motivated by the start of something huge. The thing itself, whether it's a business, starting a podcast, for this was huge for me, or putting myself forward in a leadership capacity, carries enough power to get me started. So I find the beginning of projects so exciting. I also love wrapping them up, especially when things end better than I imagined. My people. It is the middle I struggle with. So when I look back on my life, I see a trail of unfinished projects. And while I'm not surprised, I do feel a sense of disappointment. Many of these projects I was excited to begin, but I lost the zeal halfway through. Consequently, I developed a fear of committing to new beginnings because I wasn't confident that I would finish. I discovered that I was using the buzz and the excitement of newness as the fuel to get started. And of course, once the novelty wore off, so did the energy to keep going. I have learned that relying on positive feelings to get things done has a major drawback because we won't always feel happy or positive. And as we've seen from Grace's life, the fear of any type of pain isn't helpful either. During the early stages of my business, which I call the lean years, as detailed in episode one, I learned a life-changing lesson. So picture this. I was broke. I had bills piling up and All I could think of was my physical lack because that's all I was surrounded by. I also used to write at the time for a few magazines, you know, just ad hoc articles on interior design. And I had missed the submission deadline for one of them, but I didn't care. Yet I heard God loud and clear tell me in response to my crying out for help to go and write my article. But God, I'm a creative and we creatives need a clear head to write or produce anything of value. Right now, I am stressed and I am broke. I am not feeling creative and I don't have anything to offer. But I couldn't shake off that insistence to write. So I went to write not out of obedience, but just because I couldn't shake it off. I tidied up my desk because I believe a tidy space is the start of a tidy mind and got down to write and to my surprise churned out a really good article on designing children's rooms. I learned that day that it was possible to be productive even when there was a physical or emotional lack. I believe the true source of our creativity is the spirit of the man Yes, you create with your mind, but your mind is fed by your spirit, which is one with God. And if your mind feels empty, your spirit is always open at both ends, one to receive from God and the other to pour into your mind. In a nutshell, you're always connected to the Creator. So from that day, I knew I could no longer rely on my emotions to propel me forward. And I have to say that it is tough. Because head knowledge is one thing, taking action, quite another. 
And by the way, that article I wrote, well, a couple read it, emailed me and hired me to design their children's rooms. And until a couple of years ago, it remained my single biggest design contract from a place of emptiness and a place of lack and worry and stress, abundance and beauty were birthed. In the previous episode on the principle of intention, I asked you a question. What do you really want? Today, I would like to add another. What pain are you trying to avoid? I believe that our actions are driven by one of two emotions, joy and pain. But I also believe we can master our emotions so that our decisions can come from a more authoritative space, which is our spirit. Do you agree that your spirit is one with God? It doesn't get any better or closer. If I had to list the number of emotional decisions I have made so far, we'll have to rechristen this the never-ending episode. And here are some examples. I have avoided relationships I could have benefited from because I didn't want the gruffness of their personality to rob me of the wrong way, thereby hurting my fragile ego. I have also made business decisions because I didn't want to annoy the customer or not be the one to make them smile, and it has hurt me. So what do you do when you find yourself at a difficult crossroads? Use these steps to make your decision. One, bring yourself into a place of peace. You can do deep breathing, worship, prayer, go for a walk, whatever brings you peace. A peaceful mind is more likely to make smart decisions than a mind that's in turmoil because the goal of a tumultuous mind is reassurance and that's what you will end up walking towards. In the previous episode, I shared how my goal was to grow my business by working with a mentor, but my intention was tailored to soothe the lack that was going on beneath the surface. Number two, list your facts versus assumptions. This was discussed in episode two. I also have an example on my social media feed. In a nutshell, there are facts that we can act on and there are assumptions which feel so true and so real, but are actually not even in existence. And if you don't know the difference between what you're assuming and what is real, you will start to make plans and decisions based on what you assume. And that will take you completely off course. Number three is a question. Besides the other questions I mentioned, Ask yourself, does this line up with my vision? And what is my true intention? What do I really want? You see, when I mentioned the friendship, I knew very quickly that this person did not line up with the vision I had for my life. And I knew she wasn't meant to be in my life. I could see that. But what I was doing was force feeding and remolding her to fit into my life almost as though I was trying to tell my radar, you're wrong and I'm right, it works. (laughs) And so what happens when you walk with people who have a different agenda from what you have or people who have the power to steer you in the wrong direction is that you will end up denying your true calling and you will end up denying the longing in your spirit, which is always longing for your purpose to be fulfilled. So it's always important to ask these questions. Does this line up with my vision and not make an emotional decision? Just because a person is nice and sweet and friendly or beautiful does not mean that they are supposed to be in your life. Finally, make a decision without consulting your emotions. I cannot overstate the importance of this fourth step because it has worked for me. I cannot quantify the number of decisions I've made the second time, because sometimes we make decisions twice if you've got the opportunity to rework what you've already done. The decisions I've made the second time and taken my emotions out of the picture 
has just been every single time has been a good one every time and i also recognize that we all have these moments i like to call them portals we have these moments where we see a portal we see through a portal into the person or into the picture or the life that we're supposed to have and there are these moments where you get a very clear vision of who you were created to be and at the same time you get an abundance of confidence that you can do these the things that would lead to it and you also get a clear sight of your own gifts and your own ability and it's almost like I don't know what you call it, but the opposite of the perfect storm where different elements come together to form a storm. In this case, different elements come together to form certainty that what you desire will actually happen. We don't feel that way all the time. (laughs) But when we do, you want to harness that feeling and that picture and place it inside a bottle and save it. And I do that by writing. I write a note to myself. And I, it always starts with, dear Tooks, right now, you may not feel this and you may not believe this, but this is coming from the truest version of yourself that recognized the ultimate truth at a time that it was exposed to her, something like that. And then I go on to write and detail the feelings, you know, you are capable and you are strong and you're able and you're gifted and you're this, that and the other. And I write all of this down and I try to capture that moment of certainty on paper so that when that time comes, when I have no clue who I am or what my abilities are or where I'm doubting my purpose in life, then I can read it and reassure myself. We all have the version of ourselves that knows exactly what we were here for. But unfortunately, life and the vicissitudes of it all just kind of covers it and hides it and so it's not always visible to us. Can I ask that throughout this week, before you make any decision, ask yourself either of these two questions. What pain am I trying to avoid? What joy am I being pulled by? Can I also ask that you share this episode with one friend? especially if you think it will be of value to them. Let's connect on social media. My handle for Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn is my first name and surname, Talks Aroture, no spaces or dashes or whatever interruptions exist. (laughs) Also visit TalksAroture.com to read more inspirational material and to join my friends list. Thank you for listening and remember to leave always from the inside out.